This week's parsha, uh, Vayikra, as I'm sure you are aware, not only the parsha of Vayikra, but much of the book of Vayikra, the third book in the Torah, also known as Leviticus, deals with korbanot, deals with the sacrifices. Certainly this week's parsha, next week's parsha deal almost in, um, entirely with that subject. Sacrificial offerings. Now, not all of them are sacrifices in the sense of an animal. Some involve a flower. And uh, we have also oil and you could say other ingredients that are involved. But um, many of the sacrifices are um, uh, from the flock, from the herd, uh, also fowl uh, have a place on the uh, the doves are offered as well in in uh, in principle. So I'd like to explore that uh, together. As I said, that is the main subject, really the only subject in the parsha. But I'd like to do so also by having recourse to the first instance of sacrifices in the Torah, which uh, we'll get to uh, shortly. So firstly, a word about the title of this year tonight: uh, "Cold as Ice." sacrifice. Um, so the uh, name derives from a uh, uh, song, a uh, pop song, which I'm sure no one here is uh, familiar with. But if you listen to pop music in the 1970s, late 70s, then you would know that there's a group called Foreigner. They're still around, actually. And they had a hit song called, You're as cold as ice, you're willing to sacrifice our love. Now, the reason I chose that title is, as we shall see, a korban, a sacrifice, has to be brought with conviction, with, you could say, warmth. If it's cold as ice, then it is of no meaning. And although this was not the intention of the uh, musicians, I'm sure, but nevertheless, the idea that a sacrifice could be cold, could be uh, disinterested, could be like, uh, you know, um, something which is just done by rote or by habit is anathema, is inimical to the concept of a carbon of a sacrifice, as we shall see. Just a little fun fact, uh, that song, Cold as Ice, uh, was um, produced by, uh, was sung by a group called Foreigner, and the producer was a man called uh, John Sinclair. He was a transplanted uh, a Jewish boy from St. John's Wood made his way to America, to New York, to Hollywood. Uh, he is now known as Rabbi Yaakov Asher Sinclair, and he is on the Hanhala at Yeshiva or Sameach. And if you're wondering what happened to all of that showbiz talent, you can find out by looking at his uh, YouTube channel, uh, Yaakov Asher Sinclair. I forget, he has some name for his channel, but if you Google him, you'll find him very easily. And he produces weekly... Uh, three, four minute videos of a very high quality. If you take the time to view them or subscribe, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. So this is uh, Cold as Ice, a hit song produced by John Sinclair, now Rabbi Yaakov Asher Sinclair. I hope he doesn't mind my revealing that. As I say, it's all for the good because as you will see, he has a parlayed that experience and those talents in the service of uh, Torah and mitzvah. So that's a little fun fact. Let's get to our subject. So what is the purpose? What is the benefit? What is the function of bringing an animal to the Beis HaMikdash with all of the details and all of the drama surrounding it, a lot of requirements of selecting it, of um, uh, sanctifying it, of ensuring that it doesn't get inadvertently switched and what happens if it gets injured, et cetera, about which there's much discussion in the Talmud. But what's the point of it? What's the purpose? What benefit can accrue from it? So this question is asked by all of the commentaries. Um, we are all living, um, when I say we are all, uh, uh, for close to 2,000 years, the Jewish people have lived in a world without sacrifices in the Beis HaMikdash. So whether in the Talmud and the post mishnaic era, and certainly the classic commentaries until today, we are living in a world without Karbanas. And I think that we, in common with the classic commentators, struggle to understand and to appreciate, to have a natural attraction and natural recognition of the benefit of the function of the impact of these karbanos. Now, the hint is in the name. Karban comes from the word karov. Karov means to draw near. So, uh, Rav Moshe Al Sheikh has an extended essay 
on the uh, subject of Karbanos, and actually rather than commenting on uh, each verse or even a series of verses, his whole commentary on the portion of Ayikra consists of, uh, I think, maybe three or four uh, essays, uh, fairly extended essays, in which he looks at the whole subject in the round, so to speak. So that's why, although we'll extract, we'll distill some of his teachings, we're also going to look at a particular instance in which he has some uh, beautiful and creative things to say. So firstly, he quotes Rabbeinu Yitzchak Arama. Rabbi Yitzchak Arama lived in Spain. He, was, he died in 1494, two years after the expulsion from Spain, and his life, except the last two years, was in Spain. He wrote a book called Akedas Yitzchak, a very uh, fascinating uh, philosophical commentary, has a lot of originality. I may choose him as my friend for the year at some future time. So Alishik quotes uh, Rav, uh, Rav Yitzhak Arama, who lived only about uh, two generations earlier. And he says that the whole idea of the Karbonos is that the person who goes to the Beis HaMikdash, who brings this, let's say, ox, or who brings a sheep or a goat, or he brings even a bird, and he observes the processing of the korban, which I'm sorry to say, as I'm sure you know, obviously, involves slaughter, involves a lot of blood and gore, involves uh, flaying it and separating it out uh, like... Uh, um, uh, distinguishing different parts of the animal. It's all quite, as I say, gory. And says Rav Yitzhak Arama, that is the point for the person to see what happens to the animal and to imagine in his own mind that his transgression and his betrayal of his covenant with God and his failure to live up to what he can and should uh, achieve means that he would be worthy of such a fate. The experience of the slaughter and the flaying and the, the burning and all of that, really it should happen to him. It's a way of transference. It's a way of uh, visually observing a, a, a process, which probably for people in those days was not foreign to them. They probably lived with that phenomenon uh, regularly, they didn't have uh, the same, uh, pro, you know, means of acquiring uh, food and meat the way we have today. But nevertheless, to do so in a ritual context, in a holy context, inculcates within the viewer, within the one who brings it, that identification. He says something further that. Uh, Ain Adam Chote, the Talmud says, Ain Adam Chote, Ele or Ad Yikanes Bo Ruach Shtus. A person does not sin unless he has been uh, like infected with a temporary, we would say perhaps temporary insanity, with an ex with, with a, a, a momentary, or perhaps it's longer than momentary, but it's a temporary experience of foolishness of folly a person temporarily forgot himself temporarily uh, uh succumbed to the influence the blandishments of his own itzahara perhaps the enticement the incitement of people around him and that caused him ultimately to sin a person does not sin uh, unless his awareness his consciousness of his own greatness and his relationship with God has been temporarily suspended. A spirit of folly. So he says a person has acted thoughtlessly. In that sense, he's like an animal. An animal has no cognition, or even if we say it has at a certain basic level, an animal acts primarily out of impulse, out of instinct, out of uh, self-preservation, I mean, if it's, of course, a person acts out of self-preservation as well, but a person has the duty to exercise his moral judgment as well. A person has an awareness of not only at the level of intellect, but at the, at the level of morality, at the level of, of uh, responsibility, at the level of uh, ethical consciousness. 
But a person who sins has acted in an animalistic way, responding only to impulse, only to desires of the moment without engaging the human, and I might say the divine aspect, which is part of every human being, but he puts it on hold. And in that sense, when he committed that Avera, he acted in an animalistic way. That's why he brings an animal. So according to this, and he goes on for a few pages and he sums it up and he says that the carbon itself is not the principal thing, even though there are many laws and many details, many provided in the Torah, a much further elaboration in the Mishnah, in the Talmud. But the carbon and all of those details of it, what kind of animal, male or female, et cetera, et cetera, how old, and it should be in a state of wholeness, not an animal which is lame or diseased, that is all just contextual. The essence of it is what we learn from it, what a person derives from it, from the experience. And all of this is a way of saying that when the person brings a carbon, Adam ki akriv mikem, he has to bring from himself. He has to not just to rock up with an animal in tow, but he has to bring himself back to God. And he engages... Moshe Al Sheikh in a beautiful. Uh, it's not really an excursus because it's part of what we're what we're analyzing here. But he says that with this we can understand very well a few verses in Tehillim. So perhaps you've got your chumash, but if you have Tehillim near nearby, you can take it out and find chapter fifty one in Tehillim. 51 verse 17. Now, the first pasuk that we're going to mention, pasuk Yud Zayin, if you got the art scroll, by the way, I'll make it easy for you. It's found on page 1480 in the art scroll, uh, Stone Tanakh. Oh, stone. Yeah, Stone Tanakh. But any Tilim that you may have will, uh, will have the same verses, of course. So, chapter 51 verse 17. Adonai Svasai Tiftach Ufiyagiti Hilasecha. Now, this pasuk is familiar to us all, of course, because we say it before the Amidah. Whenever we recite the Amidah, we include that pasuk. We begin, not just include, we introduce the Amidah with that verse. Hashem Svasai Tiftach, God, open my lips. My mouth will pronounce your praise. Says the al Sheikh. This pasuk is included in, as the intro to tefillah. And by the way, although it's not part of the actual Amidah, meaning it is not uh, one of the 18 or 19 blessings, but it is an essential prelude to it. And even though we have a principle, an important halachic principle, that one may not interrupt between geula, that's the recollection of the redemption from Mitzrayim, and tefillah, the Amidah, we have to proceed without delay, without any interruption from one to the other. We say the bracha ga'al Yisrael, and we begin immediately uh, the Amidah. But we still have this pasuk as the prelude. It is an essential introduction. In fact, if you forget to say it, you have to repeat the Amidah. It's an essential part of it. And now we know why. Because we'll, we'll find out why in one moment. The pasuk says, oh, God, open my, uh, open my lips and my mouth will recite your praise. The next pasuk, listen, you do not desire a sacrifice that I will give. A burnt offering, you don't want, you don't favor it. The sacrifices of God, a broken spirit. A broken and subdued heart, Elohim lo sivzeh, God you will not spurn. So again, these three verses, Hashem Svosayti Vtachav Yagiti Lasecha, explains why prayer is so potent, because prayer is greater than sacrifices. Even though our prayer uh, service or prayer experience today is an echo of the sacrifices and was introduced by the sages in place of the sacrifices because the sacrifices are no longer accessible to us. But according to Al Sheikh and uh, Akeda Sitzchak and many other uh, sources, the essence of the Korban is only to evoke, is only to inspire and move a person to become close to God. So when a person prays, the prayer actually goes beyond 
the, the sacrifices. As we've seen, a person says, open my lips, my mouth will, give, will recite your praise because you do not desire a, a sacrifice that I shall give or a burnt offering you don't favor. But rather, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and or a uh, yeah a broken spirit, a heart which is broken and subdued. God will not spurn. Whereas, if a person arrives just with the sacrifice, but his heart, so to speak, is nowhere to be seen, and his uh, like spirit is not subdued by being in the presence of God and by uh, feeling the sense of contrition and the recognition of how he can do better in the future, he must undertake to do better, then the sacrifice is uh, hollow. He says, Adam ki akrib mi kem, a person who brings from you he says the meaning is from within. Yakriv mikem from you. It has to come from within you. Rachmana liba bari. The all merciful wants the heart, not just to arrive to rock up with an animal in tow. And with this in mind, I'd like to now turn to the first example of a korban, which uh, Al Sheikh explains in a very beautiful way. So I'm sure that you know. The first instance of a korban mentioned in the Torah. Now, according to the Medrash, there was a korban that was offered prior to that. However, there's no mention of that in the Torah, maybe only by a very subtle um, allusion. But the Torah does describe uh, uh, explicitly an offering on the part of Cain the Hebel, two sons of Adam and Eve. Cain was the firstborn, Hebel was the secondborn, and um, of course, we know what happened to them, the first fratricide, but the lead up to the confrontation and to the ultimately uh, um, uh, lethal uh, encounter between Cain and Hebel, the prelude to it was the fact that they offered sacrifices, each one in his own way. So the Hoshik um, explains it. In a, in a beautiful way. I have to admit that I found his comments on Parshas Vayikrit. Uh, I mean, we have um, uh, summarized part of it. He says a lot more, actually. We'll say that maybe for another time. But the reason that I have uh, in my own mind the thoughts of Kai and Vehevel is that Parshas Bereshis in Al Sheikh is very extensive. And I finished most of it at the time, but the rest of it, the last 20 or 25 pages, I've been doing uh, only gradually. And I finally finished it a couple of weeks ago, excuse me, and therefore it's on my mind, kind of heaven. And I thought I'm going to share it tonight. So let's go. The first instance of Carbonos is kind of heaven. If you've got your homage still, then I would invite you to turn back to Beratius. And in this in this stone, Arthur's stone for me, it happens to be page 20. And we're looking at chapter four, verse two. Uh Perak Dalit Posuk Base. But Tosib Lalivis is Achives Havel, and she proceeded, she Chava proceeded to bear the brother of Cain, who was called Hevel. Uh, it's not clear if they were twins. Some say perhaps they were twins, but in any case, by he Hevel Roet Son, the Kain Haya Oved Adama. Hevel was a shepherd, and Cain was one who worked the land, became a tiller of the ground. The Torah immediately goes on to say, time passed, and Cain was motivated to bring a, an offering to God. Now, he naturally brought from his area of um, engagement he was tilling the soil, so he brought something from the soil. Now, the Torah doesn't say what he brought. According to the sages, he brought a very uh, second or third rate type of product, produce. It wasn't something that was so desirable or so nutritious or so tasty. Uh, you know, the things that he cultivated in that category, perhaps he used them for himself. But he brought some, a certain, according to the rabbis, it was flax, which is just about edible flaxseed. But the Torah itself doesn't say that. The Torah just says he brought a mincha to God, an offering. Now, Hevel also brought. So al asks, we, we've, we're going to find, and of course we know already, that God uh, 
uh, spurned the offering of Heve, of Cain, and he accepted the offering of Hevel, or to put it in the correct order, Hashem turned and accepted the offering of Hevel and rejected the offering of Cain. Doesn't say why immediately. So that's the first question Al Sheikh asked: What um, failure, what like uh, uh, misdemeanor has Cain committed by bringing an offering from the uh, endeavor to which he's putting his hand, cultivating the land? Naturally, Hevel did the same thing. Hevel is a shepherd, so he brought from the flock. So the, it's true that Mephoshim, the Torah itself says that he brought me from the firstborn, from the best of them. The implication is that Hevel went beyond Cain, and that's probably why the rabbi said Cain probably brought something of a very basic level, basic utility. And there's more to be said about the flax, which is the source of linen, and Hevel brought the a flock, which is a source of wool and wool and linen, don't mix well together. But again, at the shot level, we can ask, what did they do wrong? What did Cain do wrong? Let's read the next person. Uh, and, and then he further asks, why did he say the Hevel Hevi Gamhu? Why don't you say the Hevel Hevi? Cain brought and Hevel brought. Hevel brought. Why do you say Gamhu? He also. The next pasuk, Vayash, va, I'm sorry, continuation of that pasuk, Vayisha Hashem el Hevel ve'el min chasor. God turned to that of Hevel and his, to, to el Hevel ve'el min chasor. He asked very simply, why doesn't it say Vayasha Hashem el min chas Hevel? God turned to the offering of Hevel. Why does it say el Hevel ve'el min chasor? But God did not turn to the offering of Cain. He became very angry and his face fell. What is the meaning of this expression, his face fell? Now, Al Sheikh explains much further the, the rest of the story as well. But in terms of the connection to Parshas Vayikra and our subject of sacrifices, this is the part which is uh, of interest to us uh, for tonight. So, um, just to summarize the questions, he says, and naturally, each one brought from his area of endeavor, whether tilling the land or cultivating the flock. So what did Cain do wrong? We wanted to know why does it say, Hevel Hevi Gamhu, he also brought. And why does the Torah say, Ve'el Hevel Ve'el Minchaso? Why not just say, Ve'el Minchas Hevel, to the offering of Hevel, God uh, uh, um, turned. God turned to the offering of Hevel. And what is the meaning, Ve'iplu Panav, that somewhat cryptical, cryptic, uh, no word is cryptical, cryptic expression, uh, his face fell. So Al Sheikh explains that we've already discussed tonight at length in Bereshis, he only refers to it in a few lines, but he alludes to what he writes in Vayikra, which we have already now discussed for the last uh, first 15 minutes or 20 of our shir tonight. So Hamevi Korban, he says, es nafshohu makriv. Someone who brings a Korban, he has to bring his soul. Not that he offers his soul as a sacrifice, but he offers his soul as a way of acknowledging his uh, subservience to God. In other words, like we were saying previously, it's not just arriving with a uh, an animal in tow, but he brings himself. So he says, says Al Sheikh, every person who brings a korban, he really brings two. He brings himself and he brings the animal. The main thing he brings is himself. Adam ki akriv, a person who draws near me, came from himself, from within you. So he says that's why it says the hevel hevi gamhu. He brought also himself. Gam alludes to the fact that he did not just bring from the flock, from the best of the flock. He brought himself as well. That's why it says Gam who. I think it's a very keen and very beautiful insight. Very astute. And that's why it says Ve'el Hevel Vemin Chasel. Now you can tell me why it says it. Because he turned to Hevel and he also turned to the offering of Hevel. The offering of Hevel is secondary. The main thing is Hashem turned to Hevel because Hevel brought himself. Hevel was overwhelmed with gratitude to Hashem and he came to express his gratitude, his appreciation. That's why it says the El Hevel, the El Minchasel, because there were two offerings there. Every offering is two or should be two. Then it says, Ve'ichar Lekayin. So Chazal say, Ve'ichar Lekayin. He got angry. Ma'od, he got very angry, furious. 
When a person gets furious, when a person loses his temper, a person gets angry and he errs. It is a formula which is uh, repeated time and again in the Torah also, in the Moshe Rabbeinu, that says about Moshe Rabbeinu as well. When he got angry, he erred. And that's what happened to, to uh, Cain. This is the first, like, occasion where the Torah records fury, anger, he lost control. And he was so upset that he said, according to the sages, less din, less dayan, there's no judgment, there's no judge. And he essentially uh, um, denied God, denied the, the authority of God. And that's when it says, his face fell, says al it's bit derech drash, the tselem elokim, the face symbolizes the way in which a person is made in the image of God. There's no one more in the image of God than Adam and Eve and their progeny, like first generation image of God, Cain and Heather were image of God. But when he got angry and he began to scoff and he began to curse, he began to blaspheme, then he, uh, then nafal panab, his face fell away from him. He lost the tselem elokim. And Hashem rebuked him, and he did, uh, well, he didn't do tshuva because he confronted Hebel, he killed Hebel. So uh, we see here, and we'll summarize with this now, we see here that the karbanot are a way of teaching us, of inculcating within us the danger and the, um, the uh, problem, the, what's the correct word, the, the, um, poor, poor performance of mitzvahs anashim milumada. That's a uh, um, biblical expression in Yeshaya. We find that uh, a person who does mitzvahs by rote, by habit, by mimicry, by uh, like autopilot, we might say, if a person does a mitzvah and a person brings a korban in a thoughtless way, in a rote way, in a way which is hollow but lacking in conviction, then such an offering is rejected by God himself. Like we mentioned in the Pasuk in, in the Pesukim in Tehillim, Hashem does not desire the offerings. And of course, the prophets inveigh against that famously as well, Yeshaya and the other prophets also. And we see it in the first example of an offering, Cain and Hevel. Cain brought an offering that was just by rote. Hevel, as we've seen, brought an offering of a much more meaningful standard, of a much more meaningful experience he brought himself with the carbon, and therefore Hashem accepted the, the offering of, of Hevel and rejected the offering uh, of, uh, of Cain. And I would just say that as Pesach approaches, of course, we have the Korban Pesach. Hopefully we'll have a chance still to fulfill the Korban Pesach this year with the coming of Mashiach. But as a minimum, we can certainly learn about the Korban Pesach and derive inspiration from it. And I would just like to say that Pesach today was Rosh Chodesh Nisan, ended a couple of hours ago. And as we know, Rosh Chodesh Nisan is the time of new beginnings. It's a time of uh, excitement, a time of enthusiasm, a time of opportunity. And therefore, as we read about the Karbonos this week in the Shulan and the Shamas and Parshas Vayikra, let us relate to it not as an ancient, obscure ritual, but rather as a means of getting close to Hashem. And as we've seen, a person has a similar opportunity within prayer itself. And that's why we say that possible Adonai Svasai Tiftach Ufia Giti Lasecha. With that, we'll end for tonight. Thank you very much. And I wish everybody a wonderful Shabbos. Um, next week, we're having on Wednesday night and Thursday night. Wednesday night, we're doing the first part of our Pesach seminar, which will be some practical aspects of Pesach. And on Thursday night, in the same Al Sheikh slot, we're going to do Al Sheikh on the Haggadah. We're going to share some ideas that I have um, uh, read and uh, studied in Al Sheikh's commentary regarding Yitzhak Mitzrayim and other aspects which feature in the Haggadah. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next week on what, Thursday night in the same slot, half an hour slot. But we're also doing Wednesday night for those who would like to join us on the same link for uh, the first part of our Pesach seminar. I wish you a uh, wonderful Shabbos.